hello everyone, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. Tonight, once and for all, I am beginning the final say, the final authority on the F3 Nimzo. Uh, this is going to be a series where I go directly through all of the relevant variations in the F3 Nimzo Indian and give you guys a, a working knowledge of how to play the opening and the goal, as with the Nidorf series, is that by the end of it, you're confident enough to just pull it out uh, at notice and play it in, in your real over-the-board games. Um, and I have taught some lectures uh, featuring the F3 Nimzo or revolving around the F3 Nimzo, but as I said, this video series is going to be the final authority on it. Um, I am hopefully going to be linking a Lee Chess study with all of the lines and all of the variations uh, that we go over each Monday night in the YouTube description. So if you do want to have sort of a record of these lines, that's something that a lot of people requested during the Night Earth series, they are going to be available in that YouTube description each week. And then, give me some feedback on this, but I was toying around with the idea of putting in a little extra work and maybe making a chessable repertoire. I know that's all the rage these days. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments and in the chat here, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see if I actually get around to it. But for this lecture, I wanted to start off with uh, not the main line at the top level, but by far the most common line at the club level, the amateur level. And it's a really interesting thing to see the, the huge disparity between uh, what the top players are playing and what the, the class level players are playing. Because the top level players, they, they sort of avoid this line like the plague. They, they sort of realize that, hey, this stuff is really difficult to play for black if, if you go into these variations, and white might just be getting a, a distinct opening advantage. So this is why I like the F3 Nimzo so much. It has definitely scored me more, you know, quote unquote, free wins in my tournament history than, than any other opening. Because so many uh, class level players are just playing into this line that is very, very, very difficult for black. And so to start with, we are going to get to some real chess games by some high level players. But I wanted to give you a quick four games that I played in the past year. All of these are, are 2019 and onwards. Um, four games where I was just strictly winning by move 25, and in most of them I used very little time on my clock because it's all moves that I had played, you know, a hundred times before. This is just how everybody is losing to the F3 Nimzo. To start off with, I want to show you this game that I played against Derek Higgins, which, by the way, these chess players are, are you know, not, not passers by any means. These were all uh, around the 2000 level, a little bit higher in most cases, and this is just how all of my games are going, right? So to start with, we have d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, and the, you know, denoting move of the opening, the f3 nimzo, of course, uh, happens by white playing the move f3. And we're going to get into all the nitty gritty here, but basically what I've found is class level players aren't totally pre prepared to be meeting this move f3. It's not the most common variation. I wouldn't call it a sideline by any means. It's, it's definitely main main theory, but um, players with the black pieces usually, I think, are, are skipping over this variation. And what happens when a player with the black pieces in the Nimzo Indian sort of gets a little bit lost and doesn't know what they're doing? Well, they all play the move d5, which is fair enough. d5 is a perfectly reasonable move, right? You know, when in doubt, control the center, revert back to opening principles, uh, and probably when most of the, the players with the black pieces are making their Nimzo Indian repertoire, they see f3 and they say, okay, apparently this d5 move is fine, and then I just develop my pieces and, and life is good. But life is not good. So to start with, we're going to play the move a3, and there is a bishop e7 line that we're going to get to, but we're going to focus on bishop takes c3 today, b takes c3, and then there are two moves here that get played uh, most often. There's c5 and there's castles, and those are the two that we're going to look at. And they have largely the same idea. So in this game, Derek decided to castle. White should now fix the doubled pawns and go e3. And now White's simple idea is to play bishop d3, knight e2 to g3, and at some moment push e4 and break through in the center. And this simple idea is actually so powerful that this is how I'm scoring all of these free wins in the F3 Nimzo. I'm getting this exact position over and over and over again. Players with the black pieces continue to play into this position in this very simplistic plan where you develop the bishop, develop the knight, and push e4 is just, just scoring free wins. And 
here's how. Black played in the game, rook e8, bishop d3, c5, attacking the center. This is the correct idea. Knight e2. And then anybody who's anybody is playing b6 and bishop a6 to get rid of this powerful bishop. And we're going to look at this. That's what I like to call the main line in this e takes d5 variation. When black goes b6 and bishop a6 to get rid of the bishop. But over the board, uh, I have very, very rarely faced this. So in the game, knight c6 was played. And I think this is a little bit of a misstep because black can no longer get rid of this light squared bishop. So just for the sake of uh, example, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, I castled. Black played c4, which we'll see is a mistake because it gives up pressure on the d4 pawn. The bishop simply retreats. Now b6 was played. Like I said, knight g3. White's moves are all very, very simple. We're controlling the e4 push. Black played uh, h6, e4. Uh, black was now powerless to stop this move. There's just no way to prevent white from getting e4. D takes, e takes. Bishop g4 was played. Queen e1. And then my opponent was so terrified of my attack that they sacrificed a piece on d4 and went on to lose very, very quickly. Just centralizing the pieces. Rook takes f6 is always a good sacrifice in these lines. Knight h5. My opponent didn't even take on f6. And here my opponent resigned on move 25. Let's jump into a second game. Let's see how this one went. This time I was playing against Griffin Thomas McConnell, another 2070 or so rated player. Of course, we start with the f3 Nimzo. Black plays d5, a3, takes, takes. In this game, my opponent played b6, which is a little bit of a strange move order, but nothing too crazy. Take on d5, e3. Notice how I'm playing the exact same moves as last game. Queen e7 in this case, bishop d3, simple enough. Queen e7, a very strange move, by the way. Uh, bishop e7, same moves as always, knight e2. Castles, castles, knight g3. Black adopts a totally different and wild setup but it, it just doesn't matter in this case. Uh, rook e8 was played in the game, and now I bring in a second rook to support the e4 push, and now, once again, by move 15, black is powerless to stop e4. We crash through in the center, and once again, rook takes f6 is actually the tactic that is ending the game, uh, with my opponent resigning here on move 23. Let's look at a third game. This time I'm playing Ryan Ambergy, a 1998 rated player. He actually got above 2,000 in this tournament, so congrats to him on that. Um, and once again, uh, the f3 Nimzo. We still see black playing d5. We see this trade, e3. This time, black made a little bit of a bigger effort to get rid of the bishop and went back to g6. The bishops get traded off the board. And then once again, knight b to d7 is played by black, which is not quite accurate. Again, we're going to get into the details a little bit later. Castles. Once again, uh, I activate the rook along the second rank, break through in the center, and just push the pawns forward. Right? It's, it's as simple as that. You push the pawns forward and checkmate the king. And here, my opponent resigns. This time, he survived a little bit longer, making it all the way to move 31 before giving up the game. All right, all right. I promise I'm almost done, but one more example of this just to really hit home the point that this is the line that people are playing over the board, and they're not patsers. They're 2,000 level players. They are very experienced tournament players with you know, solid, you know, grounded opening repertoires. Like they, they know what they're doing in the opening. These, these guys, you know, they're, they're not bad chess players by any means, but they're just so unprepared for this F3 Nimzo Indian, and these are the games that you guys are going to be getting most of the time. Right, most of the time. One more game, one more game. This time I was against Luke Yu. Again, the F3 Nimzo. This time black doesn't even play D5. Luke just captured on C3 unprovoked, which of course in the main line I'm playing A3 to provoke this move. So this just wastes time. Then D5, transposing into positions that we know. And here black doesn't even get to castle. I played bishop A3, and this is just so, so sad. And once again, by move 25, the game is, is ending. The same moves we've seen a thousand times before now. Castles, e4. And once again, rook takes f6. And once again, the game is ending shortly after with just a devastating attack on the king's side. Queen h6, rook g7, and this game is, is over. Check and mate on move 28. So I know that's kind of a, a long introduction there, but I just wanted to show you how often I'm getting these positions 
and how badly all of my opponents are, are playing them. Now, that's not to say I've won every game of my life in the F3 NIMZO. I have played some super strong players and lost to them in various, uh, various other lines. But this, by far, is the most common move that I'm facing. And if you do a quick look in the Lee Chess database, in this position, well, sorry, we'll, we'll get back to the normal stuff, d5 um, in this position is very, very common. a3 takes, takes. Um, c5, c takes d5. And in the master's database, e takes d5, achieving the positions that we, we're actually looking at today. This has only been played a little under 500 times, right? A little under 500 times for the thousands and thousands of games in the F3 NIMSO variation. So by any stretch of the imagination, E takes D5 here is very much a sideline. At the top level, this is a sideline. This is not what the top level guys are playing against the, the F3 NIMSO uh, you know, on a daily basis. However, if you flip over to the Lee Chess database, um, C takes D5. E takes D5 here has been played th over 3,000 times. And here, Castles has been played over 12,000 times, when of course after C takes D5, E takes D5 is the only, uh, only move actually for black here. Uh, over 8,000 times, by far the most popular move. And this is by far what most people are doing against the F3 Nimzo Indian on the Lee Chess database. And uh, you know, in, from my anecdotal experience, over the board as well, this is what I'm facing, this D5 variation. So, if you go home and you look at a database yourself and you say, why is he spending so much time on this D5 line? Like the top level players, they just don't do this. Well, it's because speaking from experience and speaking from the numbers on lead chess, this is what your average chess player is playing against the F3 Nimzo Indian. So with all of that out of the way and with my you know, short little brag session of my, my four free wins in, in the past year, let's take a look at some real chess players. So. Uh, the first game I want to go over is a game between Liam Lequang and Alex Alexandrov, uh, who is a very strong grandmaster over 2570 at the time of this game. But of course, uh, Liam Lequang is or Liam Kwang Lei. Liam Lei, we'll, we'll call him. I always mess up the, the order of his name. Uh, apologies to him. Uh, he's he's you know a super grandmaster over 2700. You know world rapid champion at some point. This guy is is ridiculous. So let's see how this game goes. Uh, we got to the F3 Nimzo via slightly strange move order in this case with c4, e6, knight c3, d5, d4, bishop b3, a3, takes, takes, uh, c5, e3, knight f6, c takes, e takes, uh, but we, we are getting there eventually. So the thing I, I wanted to highlight is not so much this, this opening move order, but uh, perhaps it does play a role as to why we actually saw this being played in this game, because it's almost as if Black is only playing this position because he got move order tricked by, by Liam Lei, right? That's how much these people are avoiding this line in the F3 Nimzo. They're like, yeah, okay, I got tricked into this, so now I have to play it. That's, that's where they're at, just, just for reference. The game continued, though, with Bishop d3, Kingside Castles, Knight e2. These moves should look very familiar b6. So we do in fact see, um, see black going for this bishop trade. Castles, bishop a6, f3, take on d3, take on d3. And now I want to pause here to talk about the actual ideas in this uh, variation. So hopefully it's apparent to many of you why it's good for black to trade off these light squared bishops. But just in case it's not, I want to just highlight here Imagine if you play the move knight c6 instead, then this bishop isn't going to have a home while this bishop is just absolutely dominating the board. And hopefully, by the four games I showed at the start, you can see that this bishop is going to be a powerful attacking piece once the center of the, the board opens up and white is opening up this f-file, pushing these pawns in the center. This bishop is just going to be a, a powerhouse of a piece. Uh, that being said, there is one idea with the line of knight c6 that I want to get to, but I'm going to stick with this line of b6 and bishop a6 first. So castles, bishop a6, f3. And by the way, you know, of course, f3 would have been played much, much earlier in, in the case of the f3 Nimzo, but this is, position is, is actually identical to the main line 
uh, of this variation in, in the actual F3 Nimzo. So don't worry too much about that move order there. Basically, all you need to know, you go F3, you go bishop d3, you go knight e2, you, you castle, and you're going to get this, this exact position. And uh, as I said, this is what I call the main line. So what are the ideas here for black? Why is black playing like this? Why is black keeping this pawn on c5? Well, the fact of the matter is, uh, this move f3 is good enough at controlling the e4 square that black is just never going to be able to stop the move e4 by controlling it. And you only need to look at that game I had against Griffin Thomas McConnell to, to really see that. The, the guy played bishop b7, played queen e7, played rook e8, and I was still able to play e4, right? You just can't get enough firepower on the e4 square to stop that move forever. So what does this mean for black? Does this mean you just have to give up and allow white to play e4? Well, not necessarily. Black has a really good idea to actually balance the idea of e4 by pressuring the d4 pawn. Not the e4 square, but the d4 pawn. Now, how does that make any sense? Well, as soon as white plays e4, black is going to be able to open the d file with d takes e, and then, all of a sudden, the pressure on the d-pawn is going to be greatly enhanced by black's queen on the d-file, as well as the c-pawn. And so, the real trouble for white in this variation often isn't getting the move e4 in. Getting e4 in on the e4 square is very, very easy with this pawn on f3. But, what's not easy is making sure you're also controlling d4 enough to not just be losing a pawn at the end of the variation. So black is leaving this pawn on c5 and purposefully not bringing it to the c4 square because black is relying on this pressure on the d4 pawn to keep this e4 idea, idea at bay. Um, of course, though, this is a half-open file. So in the game, black firsts play, first plays rook e8. We see knight g3. Again, the very natural idea from white, knight e2 to g3, controls the e4 square and helps uh, to facilitate this break and then knight c6. And black is now controlling the d4 pawn uh, in order to stop this break of e4. So that being said, what should white do in response to this, do you think? I'm going to turn it over to the chat room. I did a lot of talking at the top of the hour. But if you guys have been following uh, so far, hopefully you're starting to, to get a good feel for this, this sort of main position. So. With the white pieces here, uh, black has put up a lot more resistance than the first four opponents that I showed that, that were all from my personal games. So with this in mind, how do we continue? Black has gotten rid of our, our strong bishop and is countering our idea of e4 by putting a ton of pressure on the d4 pawn. So yeah, there seems to be a few conflicting ideas in the chat. So this idea of rook a2 to e2, you guys probably briefly saw uh, in those first games that I was showing. And this is often a really great maneuver for white. Um, however, it's not the most relevant thing to the position right now. Uh, usually, you go rook a2 and over to e2 when this first rank is a little bit more clogged up, when you're not so able to, uh, to just move this rook to the, the e file via, via the first rank, right? In this case, our queen has been drawn to the d3 square by the trade of these bishops. And with our next move, which is another idea in the chat, bishop b2, the first rank is now totally clear for this rook to come into the center of the board. Now, why are we playing bishop b2 and not bishop d2? Well, of course, we are trying to control the d4 pawn. We're not so interested in controlling the e4 square. Black is already sort of giving up uh, control over this square. Wow, now the thing that we need to control is the d4 pawn to ensure that we can play e4. Because what happens if we play e4 directly? Well, black's idea is in fact working here because we are just one piece short on the d4 square and black would be winning a pawn. So the slightly counterintuitive bishop b2, putting this bishop on a very, very close diagonal, is actually the right idea in this case. Um, and now, in this game, black makes a pretty committal decision that uh, I want to talk about. So black is always, always, always facing this very difficult decision of whether or not to play the move pawn on c5 down to c4. Why is this such a difficult decision for black to face? Well, because if you don't play pawn to c4, it's actually a little bit unclear where black is actually finding active play. 
in the position, right? What is Black's active plan here, aside from sort of holding everything together and waiting for White to play the move e4, breaking open the position? It's, it's not so clear. But what does c4 allow Black to do? Well, once this queen moves out of the way, Black has a very active plan of going a5, and let's say White plays some bad moves, and b4, right? And now, with the open A file, this is where Black's source of counterplay is going to be coming from. And this is the main idea of playing the pawn out to, uh, to C4, rather than leaving it on C5. And in the game, this is the type of stuff that Black actually went for. Black actually does play C4 in this case. The second uh, Alexandrov saw this bishop come to B2, he said, no way am I opening this diagonal ever. I'm going to go C4. My pressure on the d4 pawn has already been nullified by this bishop being here, so I have no reason to, uh, to leave this pawn on c5 anymore. And he goes c4. And that is the downside of playing c4. You give up any and all pressure on the d4 pawn, and so c4 is essentially conceding the move e3, e4 to white. What does this mean? Well, it means that black is going to have a very short clock to get this counterplay on the queen side going before white is able to break in the center. Uh, and by the way, I don't know if you've ever heard this principle in chess, but what's the best way to counter an attack on the flank? Well, it's with an attack in the center. And my experience has been that this attack in the center is almost always more relevant, more forcing, more urgent than black's play on the queen side of the board. But let's take a brief look at what happens if black is a little bit more resilient and says, no, I'm not playing c4, I'm leaving this pressure here, and plays a move like rook c8. Well, white really has two different options here. You can play rook a d e1, but I think just e4 directly is fine. Um, oftentimes, it's not the most important thing if you actually prepare this move further with a move like rook a d e1. If you can play e4 and you're not hanging any pawns, then it's more often than not just, just a good move. And that is actually the case here. So black's best try is to open things up by capturing and capturing again. And then there's an interesting little tactic of knight e5, taking advantage of this pin. But after the move, queen to e2, knight to c4. Um, already here, white is, is significantly better. Um, it's at least plus one, and uh, it, it's probably going to be more than that within within the next few moves. For example, um, just one way to play would be e5. Let's say black wants to take this bishop before it's too late. Knight d5, knight e4, um, or sorry, rather knight, knight f5 is probably a bit better. And it's very, very clear that white is just taking over in the center of the board. So once again, though, black is sort of left with no active play after rook to c8. So if you even want to, you can just play something like rook a to e1 and wait one more turn for uh, this move e4. And this is also going to be perfectly fine, fine for white. And in fact, I think white does just have a distinct advantage in the position. So maybe then uh, knight a5 is a good try for, uh, for black. And once again, knight a5 allows white to play e4 without hanging a pawn, and white is perfectly justified in doing so here. Knight c4, now we can just bring the bishop back to c1. This knight is no longer pressuring d4, so black can no longer win the pawn. And once again, you're going to see things open up. Oh, so, well, sorry, not like that. Rook c8, for example, e5, knight d7, f4. And once again, now this position is, is pretty close to, to plus 2 for white. White is just completely winning in this position with this idea of pushing in the center and pushing this f-pawn up the board to, uh, to checkmate black. So with all of that in mind, I think while uh, many, many times I have been very, very critical of the move c4, I think this is black's best chance in this case. Black needs to get this active counterplay on the queen's side, and it sort of doesn't matter if the pawn's on c5 anymore. Why doesn't it matter? Because white is defending the d4 pawn enough already, right? This pressure on d4 is sort of meaningless if white can play e4 anyways. So all of that is to say, this is one of the very rare circumstances where I do think c4 is the best that black can do. That being said, how should white continue? Well, this queen can either go to d2 or e2. It's important that it stays in contact with the e3 pawn here. Don't want to hang that guy. In the game, uh, Liam Le played the move queen to e2. And black comes up with an interesting idea of h5. And this is a really, really useful idea for black uh, to remember in this variation. 
the point of h5 is the pretty interesting h4, which highlights the fact that this knight just doesn't have very many squares to go to. g3 is sort of the optimal square for it, and uh, h4 is going to make that piece move again. Uh, and now Liam Lee comes up with a, a really interesting move here. So see what you think uh, White can do in this position chat room. What do you think here? What do you think? Uh, and someone in the chat said now White's bishop is is terrible. Um, I get. I guess you're t you're talking about this specific position. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if this bishop is terrible forever. We'll see if it's terrible forever. We shall see. So everybody in the chat is suggesting the move h4, which is not actually my favorite move. Uh, this pawn is just a little bit too weak. White can't really hold on to, to the h4 square. And uh, I think black is just winning a pawn here. Like, you, you can't defend this. It's actually indefensible. Very difficult stuff. So the idea um, Liam Lay comes up with is just a, a very simple improving move. Uh, this queen is opposite a rook, and pretty much regardless of where this queen went, there's a better square for it than e2 or d2, and that square is f2. With the queen on f2, white is immediately applying pressure to the f7 pawn, sort of uh, preparing once again for the opening of the e file, and of course, stepping out of this pin, and furthermore, attacking the pawn on h4 if black were to move it there. Um, now, black continued the game with b5. Once again, black needs to get this act of counterplay going on the queen's side rather quickly. White plays the simple rook a to e1, ready to, uh, to push to e4. And now black goes for this move of h4. Um, perhaps black's best try would have been just to go a5 directly. But now white is fully prepared for this move of e4. And uh, once again, white's play in the center is just going to be more powerful, more direct than black's play on the queen side. e4, e5 is coming. And after that, f4, f5 is coming. And then after that, checkmate is, is coming. Very difficult to stop these ideas for, for black. Just as an example, let's say some you know, simple moves get played. f4, knight f8, f5, rook a7 trying to defense. Or you know we'll we'll say b4 trying to counterattack takes is is just immediately checkmate. It's it's just checkmate. Queen f7, knight h5. It's just it's so so sad. It's so so sad here. It's all so so sad. Apparently this is checkmate. It doesn't matter. You guys, I'm sure you believe me when we get to that position. And that it's checkmate. So in the game. Uh, black goes for h4, which is an attempt to further delay the push to e4, but this push can only be delayed for so long. Um, White's idea with the queen on f2 is actually knight f5 here, and this is a, an idea that was sort of new to me when I was prepping for this lecture. Um, this idea of just directly attacking the h4 pawn with knight f5 and queen f2. In general, there is a secondary idea that white can play. If you go queen d2, for example, h5, rook a to e1, h4, oftentimes knight h1 is a good move here for white, just rerouting the knight back to f2. So I just wanted to introduce that this is another idea in the position as well, bringing the knight to f2. But in this case, we see uh, Lian Lei go for this uh, queen f2, knight f5 idea, which does seem to be a good one. This pawn, not so easy to defend. In the game, black simply pushed it all the way to h3. Um, and now uh, Liam Lei keeps up the pressure with the interesting queen g3, just pressuring this, this king on the king's side. Black plays g6. By the way, I should mention white is just winning at this point. It's once again plus two in the position, all because of white's next move, e4. This is the break in this f3 Nimzo line that is just always coming with authority. Uh, black did capture on g2. White takes back with the queen. We see king h8. And now uh, there were some missteps by white. Knight back to g3 wasn't totally necessary. Uh, for example, check and check was, was good. But white never loses the advantage. We see the bishop come back to c1. Not such an awful bishop anymore, bearing down on the black king. Queen h3 check is played. Bishop comes to f4. And very much not such an awful bishop anymore. King h1 was played. Black tries to trade queens. White declines. e5. And now pressure coming on the king's side. 
and a devastating attack from uh, Liam Lei here. Takes Rook G1, Rook G6, and Black resigned rather than wait for uh, wait for Queen takes H7 check in this case. And yeah, this is just a uh, sort of a blowout win by by Liam Lei, but it's very very typical for for my experience in this F3 Nimzo. Right, even when Black does everything correctly, as Alexandrov does in this case, even when they get rid of this powerful bishop, even when they pressure the d4 pawn, even when they give up the pressure for counterplay on the queen side, it sort of doesn't matter. It sort of doesn't matter. e4 is just always coming, and it's always good for white. Um, so questions on this game in particular, and then I want to back up a little bit and introduce one more idea for, uh, for black that's useful to know about. The chat is saying I'm looking aerodynamic with the haircut. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Did Liam find this idea over the board, or was it prepped? I mean, I have no idea. I have no idea. It's been played a few times, but it's very it's a very reasonable idea to see over the board. All right, let us move along then. So uh, sticking in, in this game's variation, I just wanted to mention this idea here. Uh, in the game, we saw b6 with the bishop a6 idea. And I had been sort of touting knight c6 as a mistake because this light squared bishop sort of has nowhere to go. That being said, it has been played numerous, numerous times here. In fact, it's the most popular move in this position. But I just wanted to show what might happen. For example, king side castles, rook e8, f3. There is sort of one idea here with this knight that actually makes sense. And that is the idea of bishop d7, which looks a little bit odd. But you just get the bishop out of the way and go for these knight a5, knight c4 ideas a little bit more quickly. What's the advantage to playing like this over trading the bishops? Well, I, I think somehow black is like a tempo faster on the queen side. But I, I really don't have that much faith in these sorts of ideas from black. That being said, there is one game I wanted to go over here. And that, in that game, white was uh, Tigran Petrosian, the world champion, not the cheater. And uh, his opponent was uh, Lubo, Lubojevic, 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 final answer. Uh, this is all the way back in 1983. Uh, and that game went as follows. White plays the normal moves. Uh, black tries this queen a5 idea. White stayed cool and just uh, defended this c pawn there. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, black tried queen a4, uh, attacking some of these squares. And to be honest, queen a4 doesn't make the most sense to me, but that was what was played in the game. Rook b1 is usually a useful move for white. Uh, that's one idea to definitely remember. When black is going for this early type of peace play on the queen side, rook b1 is almost always a useful move. Why is that? Well, you just don't want to run into any knight b3 tactics. You also get a lot of pressure against this b7 pawn, and it sort of slows down black's play uh, pretty considerably. And we're going to see this rook b1 idea appear a little bit later on as well. Uh, knight a5 was played in the game, bishop c2, uh, and one repetition. And then who can guess the best move for white in this position? I would ask you guys in the chat room. See if you guys are starting to catch on. Um, there's a question about why rook b1 over rook a2. In this case, we don't need the extra rook to, uh, to play the best move, which, as everybody in the chat is saying now, e4. Right, this rook a2 to e2 idea is something that you can do when black is playing a bit more slowly and trying to be more preventative uh, of the break e4. This is a great way to add another defender to the e4 square. Or if black is simply doing nothing and you sort of have all the time in the world, again, it makes sense to bring the rook over to the, queen, to the king side. Uh, or the center, but in this case, black is not doing nothing. Black is playing actively on the queen side, so it makes more sense to bring the rook to b1, where it can immediately be useful, um, since we don't actually need it in the center. But yes, uh, black is wasting their time playing on the queen side here, so Petrosian played e4, takes, takes. Uh, takes was played with seemingly a tactic that wins a pawn, but white does have this move, rook b4 here, and this is good enough to, uh, to win the game. 
Uh, by the way, if d takes c3, queen g5 is now attacking two things at the same time. And after queen c6, surprise, it was attacking three things at the same time all along. And now white is just simply winning. Um, black tried sacrifice and exchange straight away. Um, Petrosian didn't even immediately take it. it the nice little d5 sacrifice, by the way. And then at the end of the day, this queen cannot capture due to checkmate. And this game ended very, very shortly in Petrosian's favor. Um, so impressive game there. I just wanted to highlight what it might look like if black tries this move knight c6 rather than this move b6. It has been done a few times, but in my opinion, it just doesn't make sense. The idea is to go for rapid play on the queen side for black with stuff like knight a5 and bringing in, bringing in the queen as well. But white is always faster in the center with good play. So when in doubt, this move rook b1 is occasionally nice to slow down the play on the queen side a little bit, but always just be looking for opportunities to play e4. Because as soon as you play e4 and open up the center, all of a sudden the queen side doesn't matter. All the play is in the center, all the play is on black's king, and that's the sort of running theme here. All right, so what does this mean for this d5, e takes d5 variation of the, uh, the Nimzo Indian? Is this just how all the games go? Is black just busted? Well, yes and no. I do actually think white is getting a nice advantage in these, the, the main variations, but black has a couple more interesting ideas that you definitely need to be aware of and, and be ready for uh, if you're going to play this opening um, yourself. So I wanted to introduce those sort of side variations, you can call them, in this e takes d5 line uh, with the remainder of the lecture. And I do call them side variations. But uh, this next game that we're going to go over between uh, Vidit and Kramnik, uh, no pushover, Vladimir Kramnik, but we'll see what happens when he uh, has his turn with the black side of this, this opening. Um, we're going to see what happens here. And this game actually features a line that made its way all the way into the World Championship of Chess. Notably, it was not repeated. Uh, I wonder why, but uh, let's just take a look at it here, and we'll see if you guys recognize the, the opening from any world champions uh, recently. It goes, of course, this time we play the, the normal move order for the f3 Nimzo. We get d5, a3, bishop takes, b takes. In this case, Kramnik goes c5, we see c takes d5. And here, actually, the, the most common move is knight takes d5, and this is going to get its own lecture because it's a very common, um, common idea for black. But tonight, we're still focusing on e takes d5. e3. And now, the idea by Kramnik in this game, and by, yes, spoilers, Magnus Carlsen uh, against Vichy Anand uh, way back in 2013. Uh, the idea was to go for an early, 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 early uh, pawn to c4. So, of course, I've talked about the drawbacks of this move already. It allows white to play e4 a lot more easily because it is not pressuring the d4 pawn. And in all of the variations that I was talking about, I was saying e4 is never really the problem for white. The problem is d4. In this case, though, black is playing c4 so early that white has not had the opportunity to develop the bishop on this b1 h7 diagonal. So there is a very distinct idea with this move c4. It's not just coming out of nowhere. And it's definitely something you need to be ready for. So let's see how uh, Vidit shows to handle it against Kramnik. And then I'll also briefly mention when we uh, divert away from, from the World Championship game. So rather than trying to develop this bishop out this way, we see Vidit go knight e2, knight c6. This is still, by the way, uh, Vichy versus Magnus. And now g4. And this is the, the nice idea for white in response to this move c4. And why is this so good for white? Well, black is very distinctly closing down the center with the move c4. Black now has very few opportunities to open diagonals, open files in front of uh, the center here. And so white can be a little bit more cavalier with these king side pawns. You can sort of just, just go a little bit crazy. The sacrifices on g4 are occasionally interesting, but are almost always winning for white. And principally, we, we can kind of understand why that is. Why the white king can always run this way, and then it runs into these two blocked off files that can sort of never be, never be ripped open. And so this is why the white king is a little bit safe, safer than you might expect, even after the crazy move g4. Um, now, 
we see the move knight a5 by Kramnik, and also, uh, I think, in the game of Vichyanand, although maybe Magnus Carl's, maybe Magnus uh, castled first, I think we're, we're going to transpose anyways. And knight a5 is the secondary idea with this move c4. Uh, early control over the b3 square, and this is what uh, Kramnik goes for in the game. Now we do see Vidit developing out with bishop to g2. This is the, the secondary point of g4, by the way. You are taking space on the, uh, the king's side, and you're also getting this bishop uh, a square, rather than the d3 square, which has been ripped from our clutches. Knight b3 is the follow-up idea. And then here uh, in Magnus Carlsen versus Vichy Anand, I think something like castles, castles was already included. But Vichy chose to play rook a2. And I do think, despite it being far less common, rook b1 is just the better move in this case. Why is rook b1 the better move in this case? Well, it all comes down to this sort of balance between rook a2 and rook b1. What's the point of rook a2? The point of rook a2 is that we can swing the rook across the board over to the king's side, over to the center, to support our push in the center, to support our attack. What's the benefit of rook b1? The benefit of rook b1 is slowing down black's counterplay. It controls b5 and b4, two squares which are absolutely critical for black's success on the queen side. Black's idea with this early c4 is the same idea that we saw earlier. It's to eventually be pushing a5, b5, and b4, going for these, these uh, space gains on the queen side, opening files on the queen side, and finding counterplay there. And in this case, I think it's more relevant to have this rook stopping this queen side play uh, than it is to have the rook with the mobility along the second rank. And we're going to see how it works for Vidit in this case. We see castles, castles, and now black goes for b5. Kramnik just pushing rather immediately in this case. And now, white to move. What do you think the best move is here? White to move, chat. What should we do? What should we do, chat room? And there's another question. I'll, I'll go back to that in a moment. And yeah, this is sort of the secondary mistake that I think Vichy Anand made in his game against Magnus Carlsen. Vichy, I believe, played the move knight g3 here. And it turns out that this is the most immediate of all of the lines that, that we've looked at so far. Black is immediately coming on the queen side with this counterplay. What does that mean? Well, it means white has to play with a little bit more urgency than normal. And so moves like knight g3 would be great to include. We would love to include them. But actually, white's best way to, uh, to prove anything in this position is to immediately play the move e4. And that's what we see Vita doing in this game. Strictly pawn to e4. Um, and by the way, Vichy with the, the slightly slower play of knight g3, it's not as if he got a bad position. Uh, he actually played a very long and very double-edged game with Magnus. And I think that game ended in a disaster for Vichy um, with a, a blunder way, way late in the game. They played a very long and very interesting game. And it's one of my favorite games from that World Championship match. So if you haven't seen it, I would definitely say go, go check it out. But it's not very relevant for our opening discussion because Vichy, I believe, didn't seize every opportunity he had in order to get some kind of advantage from the opening, which Vidit does in fact do here with the move e4. So what's the downside to e4? Well, see after takes takes. Black, by the way, should always be including knight takes c1 after e4. It would be a huge mistake for black to allow this bishop to live and develop out to one of these squares. So knight takes c1 played. And then, of course, we see, uh-oh, you've hung a g4 pawn. And so, in fact, this is going to be a gambit now for, um, for Vidit here. Uh, he's gambited the g4 pawn in return for these power, this powerful central duo. Uh, and it turns out, you know, if you just do some, some math, this isn't really how evaluations work. But in all the previous positions, after white got this powerful central duo, it was something like plus 1.5, plus 2. And if you do plus 1.5, plus 2, minus 1 for the g-pawn, turns out white's still out, coming out ahead, right? By the way, 
This line in particular really highlights the fact that the rook is well placed on b1. Black is now going to have to spend time defending this pawn, whereas if we had this rook in a2, it's true that our knight would be defended, but black would be a little bit more free to just push a5, b4 directly than with this rook on b1. Um, in the game, we see knight f4 by Vidit. No reason to come to g3 anymore. We don't need it to support e4. We've already played e4. Rook b8 now is the tempo lost by Kramnik. h3 is played by Vidit to force the bishop back. Bishop comes all the way to d7. And now the simple move, e5, and this knight has nowhere to go. And uh, if you don't think this is good enough compensation for a pawn, then I don't know what to tell you. White is completely dominating the center of the board. This knight on e8 is very much a, a sad piece for the moment. All of black's pieces are uncoordinated, and white has very good pressure uh, on the f-file as, as well. Uh, let's see how the game actually continued. Vidic continues activating his pieces with queen e3. See rook b6 by Vladimir Kramnik. And now d5 is just absolutely disastrous for, uh, for Vladimir Kramnik. Uh, white continues to push the central majority, and this is Vidic's winning plan in this case. Uh, notably, this is a little bit of a different winning plan than what we saw in a few of the previous games that I showed. In all those previous games, White was sort of breaking through on the king's side with some sort of attack, but this winning plan is very useful to know as well. White simply rolls forward with those central pawns and uses them to, uh, to sort of just take away every square in the black camp, and that's what Vidit does to great effect here. Kramnik now plays a very, very natural move, but it's also the losing move. Knight c7, desperately trying to get this knight back into the game, but now after d6, knight e6, knight d5, hitting a rook, rook a6, and now rook f5, preparing to double with pressure here. Knight e7 is coming, checkmate is coming, it's just, it's, it's over, it's over. Queen h4 played in the game, rook b to f1, Kramnik grabs an a3 pawn. Hooray, Kramnik! Queenside counterplay. We're all so happy for you. We're all so happy for you. We're all so, so happy. Look at how happy we are. Oh my, oh my gosh, are we happy. Black resigns. Uh, black resigns in this case. Can't take the queen. Rook f8 is, is checkmate. And despite Kramnik losing, you know, with a full belly, as Yasser says sometimes, he got that a3 pawn. Um, he is still still losing. Um, this is just just checkmate once once again. And uh, this is just a very very dominant idea by Vidit here. So the idea to, to remember, uh, you don't necessarily have to remember all of the the direct theory, but in almost every case, uh, this is what White should be doing uh, against c4. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look. You go g4. You go bishop g2. You, if your rook is attacked, you go rook b1. If your rook doesn't get attacked, I don't think you should spend the time. You castle, and once you do these four things, get the bishop to g, or three things rather, bishop to g2, knight to e2, castles. Now against any move, you should be playing e4. You should just be pushing e4, sacrificing that g-pawn. Don't waste your time with anything else. Play e4, break in the center, and then activate your pieces. That is the idea for white in this case. Sacrifice that g-pawn. That g-pawn is meaningless. Roll forward in the center and crush your opponent. By the way, I have actually had this position over the board. I had this against one player who is actually in the United States Chess Championships currently, and his name is Daro Swirts. And in that game, I got a little bit fancy, and I played this move g5, thinking that I would just be better uh, after something like this. But again, it was sort of just a waste of time to, uh, to play this move g5. I should just be playing e4 immediately. This is the best line for white, and I do believe it leads to a very nice advantage uh, for white once again. So there was one more question way back here, I believe, which was something like bishop takes g4, knight e4, is white just checkmated here? Well, OK, I can castle here, so maybe the question was way back here. Bishop takes g4, knight e4. It's so white checkmated. I mean, I can go bishop g2. I can also just play something like knight g3 here. Uh, a piece is a piece, as, as I like to, to sometimes say. So not going to get checkmated right off the bat. And yeah, white, white is doing quite, quite well with an extra piece here. So any questions on this c4 idea before I move on? Uh, 
uh, Varun in the chat is um, apparently very familiar with this game. And he says, in the final position, there's a reason why you put the queen on the f4 and not some other square. Uh, And yeah, OK, it's, it's to defend the e5 pawn. Uh, rook a1 is sort of the only idea for black. And then if your queen is on f2 or f3, queen takes e5 is, is going to be a check here. So I imagine this was the point. This was the point of playing queen f4 over queen f2. Right? This would be slightly awkward. But yeah, nice win by Vidit. Why does black play knight c1 again? Uh, well, if white actually doesn't play knight c1, let's say they just play something like a5, pushing forward, it's very, very useful for white to, to actually preserve this bishop. This bishop is sort of a monster on the wide open board as the center is, is opening up. And by the way, bishop g5, this is, just, this is dead. Even though a move like bishop e3 here, I think, OK, well, maybe not with this pawn hanging, but let's say something like this, bishop e3. Now, once again, um, White is sort of just crushing with, with the dark squared bishop. Uh, partly because it has good attacking prospects, also partly because black's play really revolves around this move b4. And a huge part of b4 is that it weakens the dark squares in white's center. And with this bishop to defend them, then white is, is just always going to be better. So black should always, always, always play knight takes c1. Uh, specifically in this case, because bishop g5 is, is very, very strong. But even if bishop g5 didn't, didn't exist, for example, knight takes g4 would be a better move that I'm not suggesting. Even bishop f4. Just bishop f4 here. And I think white is, white is doing quite well. This bishop is just too important. Um, yeah, I, I went over that briefly, briefly uh, Pip and Chuck. Went over that briefly one more time for Pip and Chuck in the chat. If g4 um, takes, takes here, you can go bishop g2. Uh, with knight g3 in response to, uh, to queen h4. You can go knight g3 immediately. Um, queen h4 might be the best try here, but like everything everything is winning. Queen f3, bishop g2, it's, it's all winning. Uh, a piece is just too much. A piece is just too much. No time. <clears throat> Seems like white's going to get mated by bishop on g7. b7? No. <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you, no. OK. With the C5 variation, yeah. I wanted to go over this variation first, just to recap for everybody, because this is the variation that I actually face the most often online and over the board against class level players, which is what I assume many of you are. Um, this, by far, is the most common variation that I face. Um, like I said, at the top level, it's not the most common, because I think it just leads to advantages for white. But um, class level? I'm facing this the most often, and I think it's also very, very easy to pick up and, and learn. OK, there is actually one more idea in this opening, aside from c4 and the mainline stuff that we were looking at with castles. And it's actually the most interesting idea for black, in my opinion. Um, and that is the idea of queen to c7, a very counterintuitive move. But it's a very, very tricky move. I was sort of taken aback at how tricky the queen c7 lines actually were. I was vaguely aware that this move existed before prepping for this lecture. I have very, very rarely faced it. I think maybe once or, or twice, even like online, um, I, I've run across this queen c7 move. But it does have a little bit of venom. And this move is actually so, so rare that nobody at the top level is really playing it. Uh, and the actual best game that I could find, I'm going to flip to now, was between these two nobodies. They're like 2300 FIDE. They just have a random game in the database. But my oh my, they played, they, like, they must have super prepped for this game because they were both playing the absolute best moves on, on every turn. So I wanted to give them a shout out. No idea who these people are. Gabriel Molina and Algirdas Raudve, but well done. They played a really good game of chess. So let's jump into it here and explore what this queen c7 move is all about. c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, f3, d5, a3, takes takes, c5, takes takes in this case e3, queen c7. And what is the point? Well, the point is, if white plays a little bit naively with bishop d3, you're running into c takes d4, c takes d4, and queen c3 check. And uh-oh, bishop d2 hangs the bishop. Queen d2, of course, hangs, hangs the rook, and white can't save everything. 
So queen c7 is a very, very clever way to prevent white's optimal setup. And it turns out that I think queen c7 is quite simply a better version of the c4 line. Now, why do I say that? Well, as I mentioned in the c4 line, a huge reason why g4 is so good for white is because black has closed down the center with the move c4. And in fact, this move, queen c7, has the same idea of preventing bishop d3 as c4 does. However, black has left the option open to occasionally open the center still. And so I do think this is just a better version for it, because the best ideas I could find for white are the same ideas as in the c4 line. And that is, you go g4 and develop in this manner. Um, so I want to talk about a few different move orders here before we get into the actual game variation. So uh, I very quickly played knight c6, which is a fine move for black. However, it does sort of alleviate the pressure on c3 here. So what if black just castles directly? Well, again, this move g4 I think is the right idea. But then black has an interesting idea to just go, go rookie 8. So chat, I'll be impressed if you guys can, can find the best move for white in, in this case. Castles and rookie 8. And I actually think this is potentially the most accurate move order by black. This is the way to, to apply the most pressure here. So, yes, for those just joining, I'm planning to do uh, pretty much every relevant variation in the F3 Nimzo. I wanted to start with this because these are, these are the very, very fun lines for whites, and they're actually the lines that I'm, I'm getting the most often. And yeah, the, the chat room has it. It's, it's King F2. King F2 is sort of the, uh, the, the shocker here. Um, but yes, King F2, in a sense, is just as safe as castling uh, after the, move F, the moves F3 and, uh, and G4. So what's the point of, of King F2? Well, for one, we're stepping off of this Queen C3 idea. For two, we're stepping off of the E file. And number three, the downside to Bishop G2 is we really would very much rather have this bishop on D3. This bishop is just so good on D3, right? And bringing it to g2 is, is very much a concession. Whereas if we can play king f2, then after knight c6, finally black should be developing this piece. There's nothing else really to do. Now we can go knight f4. And in short order, this bishop is going to be able to develop out to, uh, to its best square on d3. Now, actually, the lines here get pretty interesting, because with knight f4, white is very, very much making a threat. And this is, position has actually occurred six times over the board in the Lee Chess database that I'm using. Uh, and in all six games, black played knight e7. If you go sort of naively with knight a5, look out, knight a, or g5, knight takes d5 is winning a very, very important central pawn. So knight e7, uh, almost required by black. And then white can actually immediately start launching a king side attack with the move h4. And these lines turn out to be a lot of fun, and they also turn out to be pretty good for white. So what more can you ask for? Black's best move here is knight g6. This knight on f4 is, is just too powerful. You have to get rid of it. Um, otherwise, um, you know, black is, white is just going to develop very naturally with bishop d3 and continue pushing on the king's side. So knight g6 is the best idea. And then white can actually go for a slightly weird structure with h5 and taking with the e pawn. Now queen a5 is applying pressure here. And here I was absolutely stunned. We are in the game continuation now, by the way. It transposed eventually, so let me flip on over to the, the real Lee chess line. Or actually, no, this, this is the real Lee chess line. OK. Uh, sometimes Lee chess studies do this strange thing where they swap where the variations are. But we are in the game continuation. And like I said, I think this is the best that both sides can do so far. I think this is essentially the, the perfect main line by these two random players, which is pretty incredible. And then white plays a move that is absolutely stunning that, you know, like computers, they, they don't really even see it on, on lower depths. But when you go through the variations, it turns out to just be really good for white. So white has, you know, a very solid advantage here. Uh, pretty much any reasonable move is, is close to plus one, at least plus 0.7. But the absolute best move, which Stockfish doesn't immediately find, is the move played in the game, which is the move a4. And like, I would never, like, I mean, what is a4? Like, what, 
Like what? I mean, how do like what? Gabriel, how, what are you doing, Gabriel? You play your. What is that? What is a four? But it's the best move for uh, for white. Why is it the best move for white? Well, as we can see in the game, the idea is after queen takes c3, rook a3 is now uh, actively defending laterally along the third rank. An idea that we've seen with rook a2, but is now sort of perfected with rook a3. And the point here is that if black starts pawn hunting, um, these pawns are never going to survive. And white is sort of just dominating with the two bishops in a wide open position. White is very much better in this position. These bishops are going to control the entire board. Um, and in the game, black tried to be more active and sacrificed a piece on g4. Queen c3, still rook a3. Now knight g4 check is good. If you take this guy, then queen takes c1 is a problem. But the very accurate king g1 by Gabriel in this case was enough to win the game. Uh, black did cash in on d4, but now rook h to h3. And white not only has two very powerful bishops, but black is left with only one knight as opposed to white's two bishops. And white is just pretty close to winning in, in this position. At least should be very, very happy with, with the game that, that you got from the opening. Up a full piece. Um, Gabriel may have been a little naughty with a, a hidden engine. I think that the guy probably just prepped this variation very, very well. Um, you know, they both have uh, pretty similar Spanish-sounding names, in my opinion. I'm no expert on these things. Maybe I'm saying something, something awful, and neither player is Spanish. But I would sort of assume what happened is these two players sort of knew each other. They, they knew what they played. And when you get a situation like that, that's when you, you get some crazy opening prep. Because it's like, all right, I, I mean, I, I know the guy's playing queen c7 here. Let, let, me, let me book up on it. I know I'm going to play him in this tournament. And, and that's how you get something like this happening. Um, so OK, that is going to do it for the lecture tonight. Any questions on this, uh, this line of the f3 nim? So I'm going to call it the e takes d5 line. Uh, after, of course, this move here, we take on c3 and e takes d5. This is, as I said, not a very common variation at the top level, but it is super common. It is the most common variation against the f3 nimzo at the amateur level. Um, so any questions on this? Because this is the line you guys are actually going to be facing the most often. Uh, I'm fairly confident this is the stuff that you're going to be running into um, almost 50% of the games in the f3 nimzo. So any questions? And yeah, thank you for the feedback on, on Chessbolt. Once again, I'm sort of considering making a, a Chessbolt course. I, I'm pretty sure it would be free uh, for you guys, but it would be sort of a, a lot of work. So let me know if there's, there's enough interest for that. Until then, I am going to be keeping all of these uh, lines, all of the variations in this Lee Chess study that you can uh, access through, through the description of the video there. Uh, so check that out if, if you want a, a copy of the lines. And yeah, let me know what you think. Do you like the F3 Nimzo as much as I do? Were those four wins at the beginning overboard? Did you not need to see all of them? I just wanted to convince you guys. This opening is good. You get free wins. What's better than free wins? There's nothing better than winning a chess game without having to think at all. All right, and that's what this will do for you, okay? It's all of the chess, all of the winning, none of the thinking. That's great. That's the best. OK, that is actually going to do it for the lecture, though, tonight. If you're watching live, please head over to the Twitch channel. We're going to be continuing with Tactics Time. If you're watching the YouTube version, thank you so much for joining me. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.